Hi everyone, we're solving this physics paper today. This is 9702, May June 2023, paper 41. As you can see over here, 9702, paper 41, May June 2023, physics paper 4, A level structured questions. So I know you have your exam on the 9th of October for the ones who are appearing for the October November 2023 session. So, which is why I've tried to fit this in in my busy schedule for you guys so that you can take a look at this before you start. By the way, quick disclaimer that this paper is the same as uh, paper 4.3. As you can see that they have the same questions. So this is paper 4.1 as well as paper 4.3 is the same one. Uh, here you go. Paper 4.1 or paper for three. This is the same paper. Anyway, let's take a look at the threshold before we begin. So for paper for one, A was at 62, B was at 50, C was at 40, D was at 30, and E was at 19. Uh, more or less uh, the same difficulty as the other paper. The threshold hasn't changed much. So let's write that down. Out of a total available raw mark of 100, a was at 62, B was at 50, C was at 40, E was at 30, and D was at 19. So where should A star be at? As you can see, there's a gap of about 10 to 11 marks, 10 to 12 marks for each of them. So this should be at around maybe 72 to 74. That is what you needed to get that A star, okay? So if you do solve this paper, match with the mark scheme. If you do get this answer, uh, you are get this mark, you are good to go. Also, before we start, quick shout out to my patron. It's patreon.com slash CAI paper solved. Please do consider supporting me on Patreon to unlock bonus perks. Uh, the first tier is just for support regarding question papers and exams. The second tier is for ad-free videos, access to ad-free videos, as well as my notes for physics and chemistry, chapter-wise notes for all the chapters, as well as access to all of my OneNote files, solved question papers for physics, chemistry, bio, paper 1, 2, 4, and 5, as well as math, P1, P3, M1, and M, uh, S1, okay, from for the recent years 2016 to 2023 and i also have the older years done as well which you get access to in this year the ultimate learning experience where you also get access to one-on-one -on -one video chats with me once or twice a month along with access to private videos on particular topics uh, your name in the credits on screen on all of my youtube videos also we have three members right now so it would be awesome if you choose to support me here as well anyway without further ado let's start the paper Starting with question number one, I actually have this paper, like part of it done, part one done. So let's just go through it. So what is gravitational field? Before, before 2022, the definition of gravitational field was a region of space where mass experiences force. But starting from 2022, they have changed the definition according to the syllabus. Now, gravitational field is defined as force per unit mass. Similarly, electric field is defined as force per unit positive charge. Beforehand, it was region of space where charge experiences force, but now electric field has this definition of force per unit positive charge. And, uh, you know, electric field strength and gravitational field strength. You might be familiar with those answers. It's force per unit mass and force per unit positive charge in the previous question papers, but now those definitions have been removed. In the paper, they will never ask you what is gravitational field strength, what is electric field strength. Rather, they will ask what is gravitational field and what is electric field, and these are the updated answers, okay? So please keep that in mind. Anyway, state one similarity and one difference between the gravitational potential due to a point mass and electric potential due to a point charge. So you guys know that the formula for gravitational potential is minus gm by r, and the formula for electric potential is 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught into q by r. So as you can see, the similarity is that both of them are inversely proportional to r. So inversely proportional to distance from a point, or other um, similarities include, both of them are zero at infinity, 
so zero at infinite zero at infinite zero at infinite distance and there is another uh, similarity points of equal potential lie on concentric spheres so they're basically talking about equipotential surface like the for a spherical structure like this the potential at this point is equal to the potential at this point as well okay so that's what they've stated you can also write that another similarity wait let me just uh, move this over here there you go so another point includes points of equal potential lie on concentric spheres fine what about the difference between them we know that gravitational potential is always negative however electric potential can be positive or negative you can just write any one point any point is fine okay i think i should color code them right i think that would make things better there you go okay I miss this dot. Moving on to the next one. An isolated uniform conducting sphere has mass m and charge q. The gravitational field strength at the surface of the sphere is g. The electric field strength at the surface of the sphere is e. Show that m by q is equal to alpha into g by e. So clearly, since they've talked about the gravitational field strength and electric field strength, uh, we need to take those into account so the formula for gravitational field strength is small g is equal to capital G m by r square and electric field strength is 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught into q by r square these are the formulas that you need to have memorized so as you can see from this formula over here um, they have solved this as a ratio of g by e so can we just do that as well? I'm just copying them. I wrote g by e, which is gm by r square divided by 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught into q by r square. I can get rid of the r square on both sides, numerator and denominator. And after reciprocal, 4 by epsilon naught actually goes to the numerator, numerator along with gm. And the whole thing is divided by q. Now here's the thing. I want g by e on one side and m by q on the other side. Now, that is exactly what I'm going to do. I have g by e on one side. And I'm going to keep m by q on the other side and transfer everything else uh, to the side with g by e. So what does that entail? Capital G and 4 pi epsilon naught. I'm going to transfer them to the left side. Capital G and 4 pi epsilon naught. These two will be transferred to the left. See if that makes sense. So we ultimately end up with g by e times 1 divided by g times 4 pi epsilon naught is equal to m by q, where 1 by g 4 pi epsilon naught is a constant, which is denoted as alpha. Okay. Show that the value of alpha is uh, 1.35 into 10 power 20. Pretty straightforward. Alpha is equal to 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught into 1 by g. As you can see from the data booklet over here, g takes a value of 6.67 into 10 to the power minus 11, and epsilon naught is 8.85 into 10 to the power minus 12. So that is 8 point, or we could just use the value of 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught as 8.99 into 10 power 9 times 1 divided by 6.67 into 10 power minus 11, which is 1.35 into 10 to the power 20. Is that fine? Let's move on to the next part. Well, I haven't done this part. Assume that the Earth is a uniform conducting sphere of mass this. The surface of the Earth carries a charge of minus 4.80 into 10 power 5 coulombs that is evenly distributed. Use the information in B to determine the electric field strength at the surface of the Earth. Give a unit with your answer. Information in B. Okay. Let's use this equation. M by Q is equal to alpha G by E. M by Q is equal to alpha into G by E. Okay, so if you make E the subject, we actually end up with E is equal to alpha times g divided by it's alpha times g divided by m and the whole thing will be times q so afterwards e is actually equal to the value of alpha which is 1.35 in 10 power 20 we use the value up top 
uh, times g which is the value of g at the surface of the earth right so that is actually equal to 9.81 times q which is minus 4.80 times 10 to the power 5 and the whole thing will be divided by the mass which is um, 5.98 times 10 to the power 24 okay so 1.35 into 10 to the power 20 times 9.81 times minus 4.8 into 10 to the power 5 divided by 5.98 into 10 to the power 24 so that gives us an answer of e is equal to minus 106 honestly you can ignore the sign the sign doesn't matter it's uh, 106 now electric field strength has a unit of Newton per coulomb or it could be volts per meter you remember that field strengths always have dual units okay so either one works Newton per coulomb or volts per meter also uh, notice how all the data has been given to three significant figures which is why we are opting for a three significant figure answer rather than a 2SF answer state how the direction of the electric field and the surface of the earth compares with the direction of the gravitational field strength so we know that this is the earth and it it has mass so for any mass out there you guys know that the gravitational field lines point inwards right so it's inwards now uh, it is a charge with charge of negative so any negative charge has electric field lines pointing inwards so since it has negative charge the electric field lines are also pointing inwards so what is the direction of the electric field line and gravitational field line they're in the same direction that is inwards that's why you have to say they have the same direction okay if it was a positive sign positive charge it would be opposite moving on to question number two um let's do this i'm just going to erase this part a steel sphere of mass 0.29 kg is suspended in equilibrium from a vertical spring the center of the sphere is 8.5 centimeters from the top of the spring as shown interesting it has a mass of 0.29 so it also has weight the sphere is now set in motion so that it is moving in a horizontal circle at constant speed as shown in figure 2.2 okay it is performing circular motion uh, this angle over here according to geometry vertical opposite angles is also 27 degrees the distance from the center of the sphere to the top of the string is now 10.8 centimeters explain with reference to the forces acting on the sphere why the length of the string in figure 2.2 is greater than in 2.1 hmm. so beforehand it was 8.5 centimeter as you can see now it is 10.8 what is the logic behind this initially there was a tension in the spring which was just balancing the weight tension was equal to 0.29 times 9.81 and we know that the tension in the spring is actually f is equal to kx so it was kx equals to 0.29 times 9.81 however now what has happened exactly if you look at this tension over here now it is divided into two components right the weight is acting like this downwards which is still 0.29 times 9.81 now the concept is basically how much is that angle 90 minus 27 which is 63 63 degrees so basically this component of tension or you could honestly just take the alternate angle like let me show you you could also do it this way according to geometry alternate angles this one is 27 degrees right so let's just use that let's just use the same angle okay so we can actually say now that you know there are two components of t t cos 27 degrees is actually balancing the weight at the same time uh, t sine 27 degree is actually providing the centripetal force it is the force towards the center okay so basically since it was vertical before and t only provided uh, enough force to balance the weight um, it was smaller the extension was smaller x was smaller but now 
since t is providing two things it is balancing the weight as well as providing centripetal force the value of t must increase and if t increases you guys know that t is equal to kx f equals to kx t equals to kx x is equal to t by k spring constant remains constant if we increase the numerator then the value of x will also increase that is the logic okay so let's write this down according to the mark scheme let's see how much my words were similar to the mark scheme honestly sometimes these answers are so difficult to score marks in right it's so vague so they said that the horizontal force on the sphere causes centripetal acceleration fine which is being provided by tension now you can say that weight of sphere is now equal to vertical component of tension or there was an alternate answer to point two the one I said horizontal and vertical components of force now combine to give greater tension in spring fine that is the point i was talking about okay so there is now a horizontal force on sphere which causes the centripetal acceleration and the horizontal and vertical components of force actually combine to give a greater value of tension so since there is a greater tension there should be greater extension greater tension in spring so greater extension of spring pretty straightforward yeah fine let's move on to the next concept the angle between the linear axis of the spring and the vertical is 27 yeah we already know that uh, uh, show that the radius r of the circle is 4.9 hmm so this is just trigonometry right this length is 10.8 hypotenuse it's like this this is 27 degree hypotenuse is 10.8 so we can just use sine 27 equals to opposite by hypotenuse so sine 27 degrees is equal to opposite which is unknown r by 10.8 hypotenuse there you go so it's sine 27 in degrees times 10.8 so r is equal to 10.8 into sine 27 which is to two significant figures since our data is given to 2SF R is actually equal to 4.9 cm fine next show that the tension in the spring is 3.2 Newton uh, we can do this by balancing uh, weight I wrote this here T cos theta T cos 27 is equal to the weight okay so let's write that down T cos theta is equal to mg which is uh, the weight so T times cos 27 is equal to what was the mass? 0.29, right? Times 9.81. Fine. 0.29 times 9.81. So after you solve that, what do you get? 0.29 times 9.81 divided by cos 27, which gives us a value of T is equal to 3.2 newtons. Fine. Shown. The spring obeys Hooke's law. Calculate the spring constant in newton per centimeter of the spring. So we know that F is equal to kx okay f is equal to kx or t is essentially equal to kx now if you remember the graph this is essentially the graph for uh, force against extension but sadly in this particular question we don't have extension but rather we have the length of the spring okay so the length actually how much was the length initially it was 8.5 so the length was initially 8.5 and later on it became 10.8 later on it became 10.8 so 
it's basically like this honestly speaking wait 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 up wait up wait up should be like this 8.5 it should start from here and it became 10.8 okay so maybe it started from here at a value of what was the initial tension do we know initially the tension was equal to the weight which is 0 0.29 times 9.81 initially this is the value of tension initially which is 2.8449 2.8449 okay so initially it was 2.8449 and then later on it became 3.2 later on it became 3.2 fine so mainly remember that spring constant is the gradient of the fx graph or the f against l graph but you have to ensure that you take the extension okay the value of extension make sure that you don't take the length or else you will get a wrong value okay so what is the change in tension i want to find out this change in tension the change in the y-axis so del t is equal to final tension 3.2 minus the initial tension 2.8449 or uh, 0 0.29 into 9.81 that's what they wrote in the mark scheme so how much is that 0 0.3551 that's del t now we know that k is actually going to be equal to the del t by del x so if you input that del t is actually this value over here 0 0.3551 divided by the change in extension which is uh, you know in centimeter right so 10.8 minus 8.5 so answer divided by 10.8 minus 8.5 which gives us a value of 0 0.15 Newton per centimeter to two significant figures. Okay, that's 0 0.15 Newton per centimeter. Hopefully, that's fine with you guys. Tricky question though. Uh, not everyone's cup of tea. This whole paper is very tough. This whole question, question number two. Use the information in B to determine the centripetal acceleration. So, guys, we know that the formula of centripetal acceleration uh, is. Basically, the formula is A is equal to V squared by R. That is one formula. We also know that it's F is equal to MA, so A is equal to F by M. So, it depends on what we have. Since we don't have the velocity, but we have the force, which is T sine theta. And we also have the M, which is uh, 0.29. So, what do we get? A is equal to T sine theta divided by 0 0.29. So, A is finally equal to uh, 3.2 sine 27 divided by the mass 0 0.29. Let's do that. 3.2 sine 27 by 0 0.29, which is 5. 5.0 to be exact to 2SF. 5.001 or 5.0 meter per second square. Since the data is given to 2SF, just go for uh, 2SF answer. Calculate the period of the circular motion of the sphere interesting let's find out the time period uh, using the formula you can go for omega equals to 2 pi by t but we need omega first how do you find that out we know that centripetal acceleration there are multiple ways you could do this honestly we know centripetal acceleration is either v square by r or omega square r let's just go for omega square r it's going to be faster omega square r so omega square is actually equal to a by r right a by r a by r how much was r uh 4.9 centimeters okay but since this is in seconds we need to convert this to meters 0 0.049 meter 0 0.049 so omega is equal to root over 5.0 divided by 0 0.049 fine now, uh, if you input this here, t is actually equal to 2 pi by omega. So, t is equal to 2 pi uh, divided by root over 5 by 0 0.049. Or after reciprocal, sorry, it's a bit, wait, t is equal to 2 pi 
divided by root over 5.0 divided by 0 0.049 so let's solve that 5 power divided by 0 0.049 root over answer then 2 2 pi by answer which gives you an answer of 0 0.62 0 0.62 seconds 0 0.62 seconds okay okay moving on to question number three state the reason why two objects that are at the same temperature are described as being in thermal equilibrium okay this is really important to be in thermal equilibrium there must be no net thermal energy transferred between two objects okay so there is to be no net thermal energy no net thermal energy is transferred between them this is extremely important okay now figure 3.1 shows the variations with temperature of the densities of mercury and of water between 0 and 100 degrees celsius fine Temperature may be measured using the variation with temperature of the density of a liquid. We know that all thermometers have a thermometric property and substance. What is the thermometric substance? It is a physical property which varies with temperature. It might be the density of a liquid. So that's why for measuring temperature over this temperature range, uh, why is mercury suitable? Basically, uh, a physical property is better if it varies linearly okay so we know that the density of mercury varies linearly with temperature which is why it is used in mercury thermometers the clinical ones right on the other hand water actually varies non-linearly okay and uh, look at the mercury mercury has unique values this value never repeats this value never repeats but look at water this same value repeats twice it's not a one-to-one -one function basically right like p1 it does not have unique values okay so why is water suitable so so why is very mercury suitable sorry firstly the variation of density with temperature is linear fine or you could state that each temperature has a unique value of density that's an important point that you can highlight on the other hand why is water not suitable that is also important mainly due to the fact that it is not linear so that's our first point that the variation of density with temperature is not linear okay that's our marking point number one also uh, they are not unique or there are different values of temperature where the density is the same right so that is an alternate point that different temperatures have the same density fine or oh you have to write any two from these okay so these were not optional you have to write in two or you could say that there's a turning point right like in this turning point the gray you know that in turning points dy by dx is zero so there is a point or there are regions where the temperature the density does not vary with temperature okay that is a red flag you can't have that different temperatures have the de same density that is the point we talked about and region there is a region where the density does not vary with temperature there is a region where the density does not vary with temperature okay now a beaker contains a liquid of mass 120 grams. The liquid is supplied with thermal energy at a rate of 810 watts. The beaker has a mass of 42 grams and a specific heat capacity of 0.84 joules per gram per kilogram. 
The beaker and the liquid are in thermal equilibrium with each other at all times and are insulated from the surroundings. Figure 3.2 shows the variation with time of the temperature of the liquid. State the boiling point of the liquid. So what is the boiling point of the liquid? The point where temperature, even if uh, heat is applied, temperature does not change because it is uh, used up as latent heat. So how much is it actually? Uh, 10, 20, 30. Oh, it's not like that. So maybe four boxes are 10. 1, 2, 3, 4, 10. 1, 2, 3, 4, 20. Okay. So 1, 2, 3, 4. This is 90. 1, 2, 3, 4. This is 80 actually. So four boxes comprise of 10. So each small box is 2.5. So the boiling point is actually uh, 80 degrees Celsius. Determine the specific heat capacity of the liquid. So we can actually use this information that for the first 20 for 21 seconds, uh, the temperature increased from 25 to 80 for the first 21 seconds. So we are going to use the formula H is equal to MC del theta, Q is equal to MC del theta. Okay, Q is equal to MC del theta. So we know that Q is equal to MC del theta. So C is equal to Q divided by M del theta. Now the thing is, uh, basically, Sadly, we do not have Q, but I think we can figure that out. How? The beaker has a specific heat capacity of this. The beaker has a mass of this. Now, the beaker contains a mass of 120 grams. Okay, so this is the situation. The beaker contains a mass of 120 grams of water. The beaker itself has a mass of 42 grams and a heat capacity of 0.84. So when we heat it up, the beaker will gain heat as well as the liquid inside it. Now the beaker and liquid are always in thermal equilibrium, so they will have the same temp. And we are applying a wattage of 810. So using that, we know that power, where is the formula of power? Power equals to work done by time, or they used Q by time. So Q is equal to PT. We can find out the thermal energy supplied. It is 810 times 21 seconds. T is 21, I told you from the diagram. So we actually get Q is equal to, how much is it? 810 times 21, which is 17,010, or approximately 17,000 uh, joules. Now, if you perform the working, basically, this thermal energy is going to go to two places. Firstly, to the liquid, as well as to the beaker. So it goes to two places, the liquid as well as the beaker. So let's try to figure that out, okay? So this is how I would do it, honestly. But I'll show you how they did it in the mark scheme. So this is how I do it. Uh, 17010 is equal to MC del theta plus MC del theta. So 17010 is equal to, the beaker has a mass of 45, was it? 42. 42 times 0.84, what is the del theta? It is 80 minus 25, which is 55 times 55 plus uh, 120 grams times C, which is unknown, times 55. I just solved this and it would give me an answer of 2.3. Okay? C would be 2.3. But this is how they solved it. They, they wrote this equation over here. And then they found out thermal energy absorbed by the beaker separately. Okay, I'll show you what I mean. What they mean, sorry. So, they found out the thermal energy uh, absorbed by beaker. This is equal to MC del theta. The beaker had mass of 42 grams. Uh, it had a C of 0.84 and del theta of, you know, I told you, 80 minus 25, which is 1940 actually. 42 times 0.84 times 55, 1940.4. Now, finally, if you find out the specific heat capacity of uh, the liquid, 
this C over here, basically, this C, if you make it the subject, it is 17010 minus 1940.4 by the other stuff, okay? So C is actually equal to Q, which is 17010 minus 1940.4 divided by the stuff for C, which is 120 grams of the liquid times del theta, which is 55, 80 minus 25. Okay, so 17010 minus answer. Answer divided by 120 times 55, which gives me an answer of 2.28. C is equal to 2.28. However, since our data is given to a minimum of two significant figures, I'm going to opt for a 2SF answer, which is 2.3 joules per gram per Kelvin. Quite a complicated working, honestly, compared to other thermal, uh, thermal physics sums. Now, the experiment in C is repeated using water instead of the liquid in C. The mass of liquid used, the power supplied, the initial temperature are all unchanged. The specific heat capacity of water is approximately twice that of the liquid in C. The boiling temperature of water is 100 degrees Celsius. On figure 3.2, sketch the variation with time t of the temperature of the water between T0 and T60. Numerical calculations are not required. Okay. First things first, the horizontal section will not be at 80, rather it will be at 100. That is one marking point. It will be horizontal at 100. Also, it will be a straight line starting from what was the initial temp 25 and then it will go to 100 and become horizontal now it's all about the gradient so what is the specific heat capacity the thermal energy uh, required to increase the temperature of unit mass by unit temperature one kelvin now it says that the specific heat capacity of water is approximately twice so if you have more specific heat capacity, that means that you require more heat to raise the temperature by 1 Kelvin. Okay, so if you have a higher heat capacity, that means you require more heat. Higher heat capacity means more heat is required to increase the temp. So that actually leads to a flatter gradient. And flat by how much exactly? Since it's twice. That means the gradient will become half, okay? So remember that greater heat capacity means more heat will be required. So more time will be required to produce that same thermal energy using the same power. And how much time? Uh, approximately double, okay? So beforehand, uh, basically, it reached 80 at 21. Now, if I want half the gradient, it will reach 80 at 42 over here. It will reach 80 at 42. And so I just draw a straight line starting from 25 and it will pass through that point and reach 100 ultimately. Okay, so let's do this. Wait, I'll just erase this over here. There you go. So approximately double the gradient and then we just have a horizontal line over here okay sorry approximately half the gradient how did I find half the gradient before at 21 it was at 80 now at 42 it should be 80 if it has half the gradient at 42 it should be 80 and yeah I just follow that point I draw a straight line passing through 25 and that point 4280 and I just extrapolate it till it reaches 100 degrees Celsius and then I draw the horizontal line. Okay? So this should be your only possible answer. Hopefully I could clarify guys. So if you have double the heat capacity, the gradient will become halved and if you have half the heat capacity, the gradient will become double. It's uh, inverse. Okay? Inverse gradient. Fine. Moving on to question number four. State two basic assumptions of the kinetic theory of gases. Fine. We can go for easy ones like the particles have negligible volume compared to the volume of the container. Negligible volume compared with the gas. They said compared with the gas. What else? The particles are in continuous random motion. Another one. The particles are in continuous random motion. Fine. 
What else? There are no IMFs between the particles except during collisions. So there are negligible, right? Negligible forces between particles. Negligible forces between particles except during collisions. fine and of course all collisions are elastic all collisions are perfectly elastic and another important point is the time of collision is negligible compared to the time between collisions time of collision negligible time of collision negligible sorry about the handwriting compared to the time between collisions okay by the way this might probably be my last paper in a while uh, because I'm really busy in the next few days I might be going abroad for a trip soon as well in November so I'll still try to release uh, the paper 5, paper 5, physics, chemistry, paper 4, chemistry, the variant that I've so still, I still have to do before then, and paper 1 as well, so keep an eye on the channel. And do consider dropping a like and hitting the subscribe button, and also supporting me on Patreon if you love the content. Uh, the support would highly be appreciated, because I'm technically doing this for free for you guys. I do get ad revenue. So yeah, you can turn off your ad blocker. It would help me as well. Also do consider supporting me. Anyway, an ideal gas is amount of substance N. The gas is initially in state X with uh, pressure 2P and volume P. The gas is cooled at constant volume to state Y with pressure P. Okay, so let's try to form a diagram of sorts. Then I think it would be easier for us. So firstly, uh, the gas, ideal gas has amount N. It is initially in state X with pressure 2P and volume V. Next, it moves on to state Y where it has uh, pressure P. It is cooled, by the way. This is a key word. It is uh, cooled. State X, 2P, V, moles of N at state Y. It has pressure P. And then it is then heated. So in this state, since it was cooled, it was minus Q. And by the way, it has it is an ideal gas, so it has no potential energy. Energy, internal energy, totally depends on, you know, internal energy totally depends on the heat, the temperature. Okay, so if temperature increases, internal energy will increase. If temperature decreases, internal energy will decrease. Because it only has kinetic energy, right? Nothing else, no PE. So now, uh, the gas is then heated at constant pressure. Okay, so at constant pressure now, what happens? The gas is heated. So it's plus Q now. We have constant pressure, state Z, with volume 2V. Fine. So the volume is 2V now. Finally, the gas returns at constant temperature to state X. Okay, so it goes to Z. Fine, it goes to Z. And has a volume of 2V, but then returns back to X again. So this is the overall state. This is the overall state. Also, uh, this does remind me of the question in variant 4.2. I do have a better explanation for that. I'll add this in the at the end of the video where I do talk about it for variant 42. Determine an expression for the temperature of the gas in state x in terms of n p and v. So we know that the general formula for an ideal gas is p v equals to n r t. Now we need to find out an expression for the temperature of the gas. So t is going to be equal to what is the pressure? It is initially a uh, 2p times the volume v divided by nr. So this is the expression. 2pv by nr. So t is equal to 2pv by nr. This is our answer. And identify any other symbols. 
identify any other symbols that you use so we want to say that r is our uh, molar gas constant okay r is the molar gas constant at 8.31 on figure 4.1 sketch the variation with volume of pressure for the gas as the gas undergoes the three changes the state x is labeled label states y and z so x is labeled here as you can see so what does uh, v uh, sorry what does z have z has a volume of 2v so z should lie somewhere over here and for y we know that the gas is cooled at constant volume constant volume so uh, for y the volume will remain at v but the pressure will drop to p it is cooled at constant volume i totally missed that it is cooled at constant volume where volume is constant but pressure drops to p so this is state y and then what happens we know that it is heated at constant pressure so pressure will remain constant but the volume increases to 2v now so the pressure will remain constant at p but the volume increases to 2v now okay volume increases to 2v and that is state z now uh, we are just asked to label states y and z so we label them and sketch the variation with volume of pressure for the change for the gas as the gas undergoes the three changes okay so we actually have to draw arrows as well for these changes so let's go for it so firstly the change from x to y will be like this okay x goes to y and then the change from y to z uh, should be like this it changes at constant basically at constant pressure so but the volume doubles and at the end of the journey what happens it will come back to its original position which is x right so at the end of the journey you can just draw a line like this an arrow actually a line would be preferred here you go there you go Sometimes it's just so hard to draw. Yeah, okay. So we return from Z to Y ultimately. This is too long. I need to reduce the length. Oh god. There you go. Okay. So this is it. So yeah, according to the mark scheme, sketch straight vertical line x, y from v to p to v, p, fine. Then straight horizontal line y, z from v, p to 2, v, p. And then curve with gradient increasing from z to x from 2, v, p to v, 2, p. Okay, so why is this important? Why is this always a curve? Mainly because why were the other ones uh, straight lines? Mainly due to the fact that they said that the... Uh, for x to y the gas is cooled at constant volume and in the next one the gas is then heated at constant pressure so it meant that the volume never changes so it remains vertical and the pressure number never changes so it remains horizontal but in this case listen whenever you move diagonally okay whenever you move diagonally uh, there is no straight fact that you must be a line there is no fact that you must be a straight line okay because they just say that the gas returns to constant temperature so always if your movement is not you know at constant volume or at constant pressure it will never be a straight line it will always be curved this is the main fact that you guys need to figure out okay if your movement is not at constant pressure or at constant volume otherwise it will always always be a curve okay you guys need to know and 
it will be of increasing gradient it won't be like this okay it won't be this this shape not with decreasing gradient it will always be of increasing like this okay from z to x this is the main fact that you need to know so yeah you could have lost one mark by drawing a straight line so be be wary now during the change of state from y to z the increasing internal energy of the gas is u so you guys know that u is equal to del w plus del q this is the general formula during the change from z to x the work done on the gas is w okay fine complete table 4.1 to indicate for each of the three changes of state the increasing internal energy of the gas the thermal energy transferred and the work done on the gas in terms of p v u and w fine so let's go from x to y so we know that from x to y uh, the gas is cooled so since it is cooled uh, there will be a loss of thermal energy however the change occurred at constant volume you guys know the formula of work done by a gas it is p del v if a change occurs at constant volume del v is actually zero at constant volume therefore the work done will also be zero so for change x to y since it was done at constant volume the work done on the gas is actually zero this is your first step okay next we'll come back here later now the gas is cooled at constant volume then the gas is then heated at constant pressure so when you have constant pressure you can use the formula p del v and the volume increases from v to 2v okay so from y to z what is the work done it is p del v and it changes from uh like it is this is the change 2v minus v into p which is uh vp now whenever you have an increase in volume it is actually work done by the gas not on the gas when volume increases work is done by the gas so work done is actually negative so from y to z since volume increases work done is actually negative and we will express that since we have p and v here since we have p and v here we will express them in terms of that it is minus pv okay since they told us to express it in pv in terms of pv u and w so for the first change x to y since volume was constant work done was zero and for the next change y to z since volume increased by v and it's an increase in volume so work is done by the gas it is minus pv so that is the next step what else during the change from y to z the increase in internal energy is u okay now we can actually use this box over here to figure something out we know that the formula is u is equal to w plus q so can we write this that you know i'm doing it for this one currently wait up let me just remove this over here so yeah for this one we know that uh plus u plus u is equal to thermal energy which is q plus w we know the value of w so plus u is equal to q minus pv therefore q is actually equal to plus u plus pv so that is ultimately the working for the second one so i've actually found out using u is equal to q plus w i input the value of u and w i got the value of thermal energy as plus u plus pv that is uh, my working okay see the chronological order how i'm doing things fine next uh, let's go to the next one finally the gas returns at constant temperature to state x this is a very important finding okay when you return at constant temperature okay i just told you that for an ideal gas 
the internal energy, typically internal energy is sum of k plus p, but ideal gas has no IMF, so it has no p. It only has ke, and the formula of k is 3 by 2 kt, where 3 by 2 k is a constant. So u is entirely dependent on temperature. So since for the change from x, from z to x, since for the change from z to x, temperature remained constant, kinetic energy remained constant, and u also remained constant. So the change in u from z to x was 0. This is a fact that you guys need to know. So any change that occurs at constant temperature, the net change in temperature will always be, sorry, if any change occurs at constant temperature, the net change in internal energy will always be zero. Now, uh, we can backtrack again because we know that throughout the whole cycle, right? Throughout the whole cycle, I started from X and came back to X again, where my pressure is the same, volume is the same, N is the same, R is the same, and T is also the same. So what does that mean? Throughout my whole cycle, the net internal energy that I've gained is actually zero. So if you do the working, if you consider this as X, we can write X plus U is equal to zero. Therefore, X is actually equal to minus U. Okay, since the net internal energy change must be equal to zero. So minus u plus u is equal to zero. Now we can solve the others. Hear me out. We can go for minus u is equal to q plus zero. So q is equal to minus u. I'm simply using the formula del u is equal to q plus w. Okay. So yeah, this is also equal to minus u over here. And for the last one, what can we write? Uh, 0 is equal to uh, Q plus W. So Q is actually equal to minus W. Q is actually equal to minus W. So let's match. How did I do this? At first, I figured out a few things that for X to Y, since the change was at constant volume, this was 0. Next, for the change from y to z, since volume increased by v, and increase is associated with work done by the gas, so the value will be minus p v after working. p del v, so del v is v, and p is p, constant. So increase, so the work done is negative. Okay. That's that. Uh, what next? Also, I know that the change z to x occurs at constant temp, so the change in internal energy is zero. Now, how did we solve this? I used this box using uh, u plus q is equal to minus pv. So q is equal to u plus pv. And then I used this, these three boxes over here. How? I used um, the increase in internal energy unknown plus u is equal to zero. So the increase in internal energy must be zero minus u, which is minus u. I found that out. And finally, I match these again using this triple box over here. And finally, this triple box over here. How? For the one above, I used, what did I do? Minus u plus q is equal to zero. So q, sorry, minus u is equal to q plus zero. So q is equal to minus u. And for the one below, how did I find out the minus w over there? The zero is equal to plus w uh, plus q plus w plus q. 0 is equal to plus w plus q. So q has to be equal to minus w. So that is how it was done. So hopefully you guys understood. Pretty complicated. Uh, it has, these boxes have become quite difficult. Even I was struggling with the one in uh, paper 4.2. These boxes are much harder than the ones back in the day, back when I gave A-levels. So it's much harder now. Uh, good luck with all of this. I will do a clarification on the one in paper 4.2 before ending the video. But before that, let's just move on to uh, question five. Okay, so how many questions do we have in total? Actually, I haven't checked. Oh, ten. So we will be done soon, hopefully. We don't have that much left, honestly. So starting with question five. Um, part of an electric circuit is shown. The circuit is used to produce half wave rectification. Okay. So let's draw a diode. We need one diode for half wave rectification. So there you go. One diode. Next, 
a component is missing, complete the circuit at by adding the circuit symbol. A capacitor C is shown. State the effect of V out. What is the role of V out? It is used for smoothing. So what happens to the output? It is used for smoothing, or we can just say it's V out is smooth smoothed. Okay. Smooth it out. Okay. Now figure five point two shows the variation with time of V in the voltage that we are giving. Now I think we have to draw the variation. Oh, the variation of V out is also given. Uh, determine the frequency of V in. Pretty straightforward. As you can see, the time period for every rotation is zero point zero four seconds. So you guys already know the drill. Uh, frequency is equal to one by time period. So frequency is equal to one divided by zero point zero four. 1 by 0 0.04 which is 25 that is equal to 25 hertz show that the time constant tau for the discharge of the capacitor through the resistor is 0 0.038 seconds okay so this is the new addition to the syllabus starting from uh, 2022 tau tau is actually equal to you know uh, rc tau this symbol over here is equal to rc so basically to find out tau we need the value of r and c but clearly look at the next part they've asked us to find out the value of c so since we know that tau is equal to rc and they've asked us to find out c in the next part what does that mean that means that we need to find out tau in another way in part two and then use that in part three so we don't use this equation now but later how else can we find out tau uh, using the equation of discharging of a capacitor using the equation of discharging of a capacitor so where is the capacitor being discharged discharged in this V out circuit so if we just performed half wave rectification what would the circuit look like it would look like this only this part followed by zero then an increase only this part followed by zero again so how is this different over here match this graph match the one i drew okay let me just copy paste it right it should be fine so match the one i just drew with the one that is given wait why is it much higher what the hell that's weird it went above zero i don't know if that's a printing mistake or something but for some reason it has been amplified maybe maybe for some reason it might be amplified but basic thing is that it was supposed to be down here if you follow this properly it was supposed to be down here and then go up again it was supposed to be down here and then go up again however due to the capacitor rather than going down suddenly it went down slowly so this phenomenon of going down slowly, then going up again, then going down slowly, this overall process is called smoothing, okay? So this section is unique, The this section over here. And during this section, okay, this is the important part. During this section, the capacitor is actually discharging. During this section, the capacitor is discharging and almost instantaneously, the um, you know resistor is charged up again so you guys need to appreciate the part where the capacitor is discharging that's all you guys need to know uh, the capacitor isn't being used here it is getting the uh, supply uh, from the current but when current changes its direction basically it's forward bias right so current can flow in this direction in the diode but when the current changes direction, it can't flow through the diode anymore. But in that case, we don't take energy from the supply. The resistor does not take energy from the supply. Rather, it will take energy from the capacitor. So what is the initial? What is the initial EMF? It is, how much is it? This is, this is, uh, how, how many boxes is this? Let's just check. Um, basically this is 2.5 this is 5 this is 7.5 so in total there are 10 boxes over here and 2.5 so 2.5 divided by 10 boxes 2.5 by 10 that is actually 0.25 for each box 
so 0 0.25 into 2 plus 5 that is actually 5.5 okay so the initial voltage is 5.5 and I'm going to use the formula V is equal to V naught e to the power minus T by RC minus uh, T by RC fine and we know that tau is equal to RC so let's just input the proper values what is the final voltage though I haven't find, found that out so it is actually this 2.5 plus 0.25 into 3 2.5 plus 0.75 which is 3.25 so our final answer over here is 3.25 after discharging so damn this was actually hard uh, 3.25 is equal to initial one 5.5 times e to the power minus t by t by tau so what can we write 3.25 by 5.5 is equal to e to the power minus t by tau and finally after more working ln 3.25 by 5.5 is equal to minus t divided by tau and what is the time taken for discharging it is from 0 0.02 to 0 0.04 so the time is actually 0 0.02 seconds it is actually 0 0.020 seconds so yeah if I do the working properly just one sec let me just bring it to the left hand side okay so the final step is after simplification uh, tau is equal to minus 0 0.020 divided by ln 3.25 by 5.5 okay So minus 0 0.020 divided by ln 3.25 by 5.5. So yeah, tau is actually equal to 0 0.038 seconds as shown over here. So since this was a hard one, that is why it was worth less marks and it was a show question. So you could actually use it in the next part. Now find out the capacitance. So we actually know that uh, tau is equal to product RC. So C is actually equal to tau by R. The R is the total resistance in the circuit, which is 14 kilo ohms, right? 14,000. So we use the given value of tau 0 0.038 divided by 14,000. 0 0.038 by 14,000, which gives us an answer of... One sec. Okay, so C is actually equal to it's to two significant figures, two point seven into ten power minus six. And since I use the SI units of seconds and ohms, it will be the SI unit of farads. Farads two point seven into ten to the power minus six farads. Okay, that is the important part that you need to know of. Now the circuit in figure five point one is modified so that it produces full wave rectification. So we need four diodes in total. So just for the reason how V out now varies with time when V E when V in is uh, as shown in figure 5.2. Okay, so it will actually appear like uh, you know direct current because after full wave rectification it actually turns into a modulus. Okay, it will turn into a modulus. Basically, this whole part will be reflected above. So this whole part will be reflected above. Oh, it was 5.5. It was 5.5. Check this. Sorry. I misunderstood. Here the scaling was different. 2.5, 5, 7.5. So here each box was worth uh, 2.5 by 5. Was worth 0. 0.5. So it was 5.5 here. But the, since the scaling was different, it is zoomed in over here. That's why it did not overlap. Anyway, after complete, uh, you know, modulus this part goes over here and this part will also go over here and yeah it will be seen over here so now what actually happened it is appearing as if it's direct current constant at a horizontal value okay so it does not actually vary with time anymore after full wave rectification okay so we have to say this that v in 
has constant magnitude now in both directions in both positive and negative directions fine also so v out is now constant either you can say this that it is now constant or you could say that v out no longer does not no longer varies does not vary with time fine that is it okay moving on to question number six so what is meant by magnetic field so this is the definition which has not changed this is the definition which hasn't changed electric field and gravitational field have changed but magnetic field has remained the same okay so what is it it is a region where uh, force x on you have multiple options you could either say i prefer a moving charge or you could go for a current carrying conductor a current carrying conductor or there was another alternate option a magnetic material or a magnetic pole a magnetic material or a magnetic pole one second fine now long straight wire p carries the current into the page you know that cross refers to into the page so we are using our right hand grip rule i am putting my thumb into the screen and my other fingers are appearing as if they are clockwise so draw the f draw four field lines to represent the magnetic field around wire p due to this current okay fine so we have to draw four concentric circles the spacing will increase over time and the duration should be clockwise okay so those are the facts that you need to keep in your mind when you do this so that is one of them then let's go for the other one Okay, now we go further and the distance will increase, okay? It's a bit hard to draw, honestly. So they have asked, they've asked us to draw four. Fine, so now this will have the greatest spacing. Here you go. I think we can just decrease it by a bit. Let's go like this, okay? I feel like it's okay. Look at this distance over here. Look at this distance, then this distance, and then this distance. It's increasing over time. Also, look at the direction. It has to be clockwise according to the right hand grip rule. If current is into the page, then the direction is clockwise, okay? I feel like it could have been a bit better with let me just change it by a bit yeah there you go I think it's better now okay now a second long straight wire Q carrying a current of 5 amperes out of the page is placed parallel to P so one of the currents or one of the wires is carrying current into the page while the other is carrying current out of the page as a result they are carrying current in opposite directions so this indicates that they will repel opposite direction means repel the flux density of the magnetic field at wire Q due to the current in wire P is 2.6 millitesla. Calculate the magnetic force per unit length exerted on wire Q by wire P. So the thing that you need to understand here is that it's kind of interesting. I was just teaching this to my students the other day. The same topic. 
just the day before yesterday. So mainly YRQ will feel a force due to the field of YRP and YRP will feel a force due to the field of YRQ. Okay, that's the main concept. Like one wire feels another force, feels a force due to the other wire, like Newton's third law. They follow Newton's third law. Calculate the magnetic force per unit length exerted on wire Q by wire P. So we are trying to find out the force on wire Q, if Q. So we will be using the current in Q, but the field of P exerted on, this is the keyword, by wire P. Okay. So if Q is actually equal to, we know that F is in general. Let's write down the formula first in general. We know that F is equal to B I L. Now we want to find out F Q. F Q is equal to the B of P, but I of Q and times length, but it's force per unit length. So I'm just, you know, uh, moving L to the left side. Now, what will the force per unit length actually be then? the flux density at wire Q at wire Q due to the current in wire P is 2.6 mini Tesla they could have tricked you honestly they could give you uh, both the field strengths they do in some questions so you need to choose one particularly but it became too easy over here because they only gave you one magnetic field strength right so this is the magnetic field strength due to the current in wire P which is being felt by wire Q okay so I'm going to input this value over here so let's do that uh, that is a 2.6 millitesla slide to 10 to the power minus 3 times the current in wire Q itself which is uh, 5 amperes okay so what do we get 2 2.6 into 10 to the power minus 3 times 5 which is 0 0.013 okay so one more time, the force per unit length felt by wire Q is due to the magnetic field strength of P, but the current in Q itself, which is 5 amperes, and the magnetic field strength produced by wire P at Q is actually equal to 2.6 millitesla. Okay, so we end up with 0 0.013. That is our final answer. Newton per meter. Next one, state the direction of the force exerted on wire Q by P. Basically, opposite direction means that they're going to repel. So wire Q will feel a force towards the right due to wire P, and wire P will feel a force to the left due to wire Q, to the field of wire Q. State the direction of the force exerted on Q by P. On Q. So Q will feel a force towards the right. So see, you don't even have to use the uh, use Fleming's left hand rule here. If you know that they are carrying current in opposite directions, they'll just repel. That's the trick. Okay. And I could show you. I could show you that you know how left hand rule is applied. Let me show you. So basically, wire P is carrying current into the page. So if you draw the diagram properly, it's basically it's basically uh you know clockwise current in clockwise direction the magnetic field lines will be in, in a clockwise direction okay so if you use your left hand rule over here the current of 5 amperes is coming out of the page so the middle finger will point out of the screen and the index finger will point downwards so I have, my hand is on top of the screen my middle finger is coming out from wire Q and my index finger is pointing downwards so my index finger is like this downwards and the middle finger is over here it's coming out of the screen and the thumb is pointing in this direction so that indicates the force okay and my index finger actually represents the direction of the magnetic field and the middle finger which is coming out of the screen is indicating direction of the current okay so force is felt to the right but this is totally irrelevant you can directly find it out right because the current in the opposite direction so the force felt by both wires is actually the same because it depends on the product of the currents rather than the individual currents themselves okay they follow Newton's uh, third law the flux density of the magnetic field at wire P due to the current in wire Q is 1.5 millitesla determine the magnitude of the current in wire P and explain your reasoning so here we had to use that concept that I was telling you that the force per unit length for both wires is the same because they follow Newton's third law force per unit length has the same magnitude 
at the same magnitude, you do need this third law. Fine. Equal magnitude but opposite direction, okay? It's just that when we find out the force per unit length of P, we are going to use BQ, magnetic field strength of Q, but current of P, right? So we are going to use this value where FP by L is equal to BQ times IP. So we can write 0 0.013 is equal to, we know the magnetic field strength due to wire Q, that is uh, 1.5 millitesla, 1.5 into 10 power minus 3 times IP. So let's do that. 0 0.013 divided by 1.5 into 10 to the power minus 3, which gives us a value of IP is equal to 8.67 or rounded off to 8.7 amperes to two significant figures. Really good question, in my opinion and good for practice. Uh, everyone should look into this if they uh, want to revise parallel wires carrying current. Alright, let's move on to question number seven. Okay, so what is meant by the de Broglie wavelength? Basically, <clears throat> we know that the formula for the energy of a photon is E is equal to HF. And there's another relationship between wavelength and momentum. All moving particles, all moving particles have a wavelength. Okay? So that the wavelength associated with the moving particle is called the de Broglie wavelength. Now, so the relationship is lambda is equal to h by p. That means they are inversely related. So let's write down the answer. It is the wavelength associated with a moving particle. Very important. Okay, so this is it, where lambda is equal to h by p. Now, Figure seven point one shows a glass tube in which electrons are accelerated through a high potential difference to form a beam that is incident on thin graphite crystal. After passing through the graphite crystal, the electrons reach the fluorescent screen. The screen glows where the electron strikes it. So it forms a pattern like this. Now this particle is reminiscent of, you know, uh, wave nature. Electrons are particles. So when this uh, experiment was carried out, scientists were so confused because uh, the pattern that we expected were the specks of light. Because electrons are particles, when they strike a fluorescent screen, they'll produce specks of light. But provided that we, uh, you know, give it a proper diffraction rating, that this graphite crystal is providing, it can be seen that the electrons actually diffract to form waves, and which gives us this uh, pattern. After passing through the graphite crystals, the electrons reach the fluorescent screen. The screen glows where the electrons strike it. Figure 7.2 shows the fluorescent screen viewed end on from right, from the right hand side of figure 7.1. So what is this phenomenon demonstrated by the pattern? This particular pattern is, uh, it's called electron diffraction. This phenomenon is called electron diffraction. Very, very important. We need this. And what can be concluded from the pattern in 7.2 about the nature of electrons? So it can be determined that electrons are actually behaving as waves rather than particles. So this is how we write it. So we have to say that the beam spreads out the beam spreads out, indicating the beam spreads out, indicating diffraction, or an alternate marking point for this was this is typically like an interference pattern. Remember in AS back in AS, you guys did, uh, you know, the interference pattern, Young's double slit, where we got this regions of bright light and regions of dark light, that was an interference pattern. 
d to superposition or the alternate mark for this point is that light and dark light and dark regions indicate an interference pattern indicate an interference pattern fine now what about the second point that we need to get there is the one I was telling you that the electrons are behaving as a wave or according to the mark scheme the electron beam the electron beam is behaving as a wave this is the important point okay because the beam spreads out rather than being specks of light it spreads out indicating that the electrons are behaving as uh, waves rather than particles now the electrons in B are now accelerated through a greater potential difference between the cathode and the anode. On figure 7.3, sketch the pattern that is now seen on the fluorescent screen. So this is important because they are accelerated through a greater potential difference. So a higher PD indicates that the electrons will have more energy and we know that E is equal to HF. So if energy increases, Planck constant being the same, the value of frequency will increase. Now you guys know that if frequency increases then what will happen to wavelength? The wavelength will decrease. Now what impact will this have on the diagram actually? Basically as frequency increases we know that the de Broglie wavelength is like this de Broglie is equal to h by p or you could think of it this way since the particles or electrons are accelerated through a greater potential difference they have higher velocity they have higher momentum and if momentum increases since they're inversely proportional lambda must decrease so if we talk about concentric circles beforehand if the pattern was like this now the rings must be closer together that means that lambda has decreased the gap between the rings actually refer to the wavelength of the particle okay that's what you need to know that the gap between the concentric rings represent the wavelength of the particle so according to the mark scheme it's stated that there should be a central blob and concentric rings and the rings are closer together than previously So this is the pattern. So we need a central blob at first. I can actually show you uh, show you an example. Uh, Feb March, twenty twenty two. Let's still check though. Yeah, this one over here. It's got this pattern. Beforehand, we had a pattern like this, but now the gap between the concentric rings is much smaller. Okay, so that's the general idea. So that's what we have to do over here. So we have to draw the central blob at first, but afterwards the rings will be closer together compared to the previous state so we have to draw a central blob my bad wait here you go afterwards we are going to draw some circles over here Okay, one more. But the problem is in the previous figure, I, I don't see multiple rings over here. Probably they were talking about this. This is one of them. 
well this is the other one so essentially this was the wavelength but now it's gonna be closer right probably that's what they meant so why don't I just show you here wait So before it was like this, right? Now it just has to come closer. Maybe it's gonna be something like this. There you go. And let me copy the blob actually, wait up. This should be the blob. So there should be this blob at the center. Let me just bring this over here. Followed by these lines like this. So just give multiple concentric circles but uh, they will have wavelength less than before. Sorry, I overcomplicated things. I did not get it at first. So how many rings were there initially? There was a central blob, one ring out over here. Yeah, you can just draw one more. That's also fine. There's no issue if you draw another one. It's totally fine. There you go, you can draw a diagram like this. Or I could make it better, wait. Let me show you. This is kind of overkill, but yeah, this is what it should be like, honestly. Okay, the concentric rings are closer together compared to before, basically. Basically, you needed to show that this wavelength over here has decreased in length. Okay, that was done by showing this already, but it's fine. You could just show more, it's okay. Explain with reference to the de Broglie wavelength, the change in pattern. I just told you that uh, lambda is equal to h by p. So since it's accelerated through a greater pd, the momentum is greater, so wavelength should be lower. Okay. So um, there is greater potential difference. So electrons have greater momentum. Next, since there is greater momentum, so there is a decrease in de Broglie wavelength, wavelength. Sorry. So there is a decrease in the de Broglie wavelength. And finally, uh, there will be a decrease in fringe spacing. Now you could word the last one in multiple ways. You could say that there is a lower de Broglie 
local wavelength for same spacing in crystal. Like we have the same spacing in the crystal. You guys know this from AS, right? Like, check this. What causes good diffraction? The wavelength should be comparable with the slit width, right? If you decrease the slit width and, you know, or keep the width, slit width the same. For this case, it's graphite. If you keep the slit width the same and increase the wavelength, what actually happens? The angle of diffraction will actually increase. So what happens here? We actually lower the wavelength, right? If you lower the wavelength, that will actually lead to a smaller diffraction angle. Increasing the wavelength by keeping the slit width the same actually increases the uh, diffraction angle, but due to a lower de Broglie wavelength for the same spacing in crystal, this actually leads to or causes either you could say a smaller diffraction angle that's one or you could say an alternate answer would be smaller angle of intensity maxima smaller angle of intensity maxima for each order or decrease in fringe spacing I prefer this one decrease in fringe spacing in diffraction pattern this is the best one so let me tell you the answer again due to the higher PD electrons have greater momentum which leads to a lower de Broglie wavelength and this lower de Broglie De Broglie wavelength uh, with the same spacing in the graphite crystal causes a decrease in the fringe spacing in the diffraction pattern. That's essentially what happened over here, okay? And you didn't need to draw so many as I've told you before, but it's fine if you draw more. Ultimately, more patterns would be produced, right? Due to the smaller, uh, you know, wavelength. Anyway, moving on to question number eight. Last three questions. Uh, we are going to be done soon, hopefully in 20 minutes. Table 8.1 shows some data relating to the properties of air, gel, and buoy tissue. The data are given to three senior figures. So show that the specific acoustic impedance of gel is this. So we know that specific acoustic impedance Z is defined as rho times C, speed times the density of the medium. So for gel, it's uh, going to be this one. Um, 1,200 times 1,400. 1,200 times 1,400 is 168. 0, 0, 0, 0, which is 1.68 times 10 to the power 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, right? So that is 1.68 into 10 to the power 6. So gel and tissue have the same specific acoustic impedance. Complete table 8.1 by calculating the missing values to 3SF. Use the space below for any working. Okay, so for tissue, 1.68 into 10 to the power 6 is equal to uh, 1090 times C. So what is C? 1.68 into 10 to the power 6 by 1090. One so C is actually 1541.28. So as you can see, all data is given to, um, you know, three significant figures over here. So we should round this off to 1540. On the other hand, for air, Mm, Z440 is equal to 340 times rho. So 440 divided by 340 is rho equals to 0 0.132. 440 divided by, I think I made a mistake. 440 divided by 340 is 1.29. Sorry. Uh, calculator error. 1.29 to 3SF. So that's it. 1.29. Fine. 1.29 and 1540. That's that. Use the information in A to calculate the 
So why was it given to 3SF? As you can see in the data, 3SF, 3SF. And yeah, this was also in 3SF, this was in 3SF, yeah? And they did tell us missing values to 3SF. I totally overlooked that, my bad. That was already mentioned. Now, use the information to calculate the intensity reflection coefficient for the air tissue boundary. So, why is a coupling medium like gel used? Because the difference in specific acoustic impedance of air and tissue is too high. So, most of it will be reflected. But if we use the coupling medium, this reflection can be prevented, right? So, what is the formula for intensity reflection coefficient? Intensity reflection coefficient is equal to is actually Z1 minus Z2 whole square divided by Z1 plus Z2 whole square. Fine. So let's input that. It's 1680000 minus air and tissue, right? So air is 440 divided by 1680000 plus 440. And this whole thing will be whole squared. So one six eight zero 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 minus four forty whole square divided by one six eight zero 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 plus four forty whole square. Now that gives us a value of ninety nine percent okay 99 percent one sec let me check again one six eight zero 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 yeah it's 99 percent or to a fraction it is zero point nine nine eight nine five or since our data is given to three sf rounded off to three sf it is zero point nine 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 okay so that is zero point nine 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 and for the gel tissue boundary we can just repeat the same thing it's just that their values are actually the same right their values are at the same at you know it is one six eight zero 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 minus one six eight Zero 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 zero. I missed a zero over here. One sec. Divide by one six eight zero zero. One six eight zero 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 zero. Whole square. So yeah. Uh, anything. 0 divided by anything is also 0. It's 0 by 0, which is 0. So basically, if we use the coupling medium, the intensity reflection coefficient becomes 0. So 100% of the radiation or the ultrasound is transmitted into the body. Use the answers in B to explain why gel is applied to the skin during ultrasound scanning. Okay. So the main point is without gel. What happens without gel? Almost all, 99%. Almost all of the incident ultrasound is reflected from skin. Fine. But using the gel, with the coupling medium, with gel, almost all the incident ultrasound almost all the incident ultrasound is transmitted into the body, okay? Fine, that looks good. We are good to go to the last two. All right, let's move on. Question number nine. We are almost here at the end. Define half-life. So what is half-life? It is the time taken for activity. It is the time taken for activity of sample. T 
to half and it's talking about the initial activity right now a sample contains a not nuclei of carbon 11 and no other nuclei at time zero carbon 11 is radioactive and decays by beta plus emission to form boron 11 carbon 11 has a half-life of 20 minutes boron 11 is stable so boron 11 does not decay now a sample contains a not nuclear of 11, carbon 11 on figure 9.1 sketch the variation with time t of the number of nuclei of boron 11 in the sample okay i'll teach you how so at time t i'm drawing this for carbon 11 at first we start from uh, a not and at 20 minutes right that is the half-life of uh, carbon 11 at 20 minutes it's going to become half of its initial value and at 40 minutes it's going to be half of that so where is that exactly two three four five over here so at 40 minutes it's going to be half of that and at 60 minutes half of that and 80 minutes even half of that so 0.25 divided by 2 divided by 2 which is 0 0.0625 half of 2.5 boxes is 1.25 boxes 1.2 somewhere over here so essentially this is the graph okay this is the graph for um, carbon 11 so the graph for boron 11 should just be the inverse okay the graph of this is so hard to do, draw on this graphics tablet Oh, damn it something like this now same points but born 11 is gonna start from 0 and then it's gonna extend up here it's gonna go here it's gonna go up here and then 1.25 from there here you go okay so let's do it I'm gonna try to draw a smooth line okay Damn it. There you go. Okay. So this is the variation for born 11. Just the mirror image of carbon 12. Okay. Exponential ex extending from 0 to 80 with gradient of steadily decreasing magnitude. Line passing through 0, 0, 20.5, 40.75. Perfect. What's next? Explain with reference to the random nature of reactive decay why the activity of carbon 11 sample in B decreases with time. Okay. Good question. I haven't seen this before. So what is what does random nature of decay mean? We cannot predict which particular nucleus will decay. And every unstable nuclei has the same probability of decay. But if you decrease the number of unstable nuclei, the probability that one of them will decay also decreases, right? Because think of this. If you have 1,000 die and you throw them, what is the... If you have 6,000 die and you throw them, what's the probability of obtaining a 6? The expectation is uh, 1 by 6 into 6,000, which is 1,000. Now, if you reduce it to 600 die, yeah, the probability of obtaining a 6 will be the same, 1 by 6. But the number of 6s obtained will be lower, right? 600 times 1 by 6, which is 100. So if we decrease the total number of events or the total, total number of unstable nuclei, even though the probability remains the same, the number of successful events will decrease, okay? Because it's basically a probability. It's The activity is A is equal to N lambda. That's the main thing that you guys need to understand, that the activity is basically n lambda okay so this lambda remains the same now if you decrease the value of n then the value of a will also increase okay that's the logic why the activity decreases because a is equal to lambda n even though lambda remains constant n changes so a will also decrease all right so the concept is every undecayed nucleus has the same probability of decay and what else since there are fewer undecayed nuclear remaining with time 
since there are fewer undecayed nuclei remaining with time so fewer will decay in a given time interval right I did not like their wording honestly but they did tell us to uh, refer to the random nature of reactive decay I would personally go for a is equal to lambda n since lambda remains the same probability of decay remains the same if uh, the number of unstable nuclei decreases the activity must also decrease I would honestly just give a mathematical answer okay but yeah what else do you have to do what else option do you have honestly you have to under uh, you know memorize this state with reasons whether a radiation detector placed near to the sample of carbon 11 indicates a measured count rate from the sample that is less than the same as or greater than the activity of the sample okay so firstly there is always background radiation present and also maybe carbon 11 might be in a vessel like this it actually emits in all directions this way 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 but our detector is over here the Geiger counter okay so we will only pick up this radiation this one so we will not pick up these so we might get less also what else uh, there might be a date time of the counter which is a problem with the instrument and there are other points okay and some might be absorbed within the air before reaching the counter those are other common points right so let's write down the answers state why with reasons with the radiation detector placed near to the sample indicates a measured count rate from the sample is less same or greater let's start so mostly it will be less because we are not picking up the mo picking up most of the radiation right that's the main issue so let's go for it the sample emits in all directions but the detector only captures emissions in one direction as I've told you the orange arrow next what else do we have some emissions are absorbed before reaching detector fine by the air maybe so it doesn't even go to the detector in the first place and some emissions are scattered within the sample this is also true some emissions are scattered within the sample fine so we have three marks over there and what else simultaneous arrival of multiple particles only registers once that is called the date time of the counter basically the counter has a time period before it can reset again so if a lot of radiative particles I reach the counter simultaneously it will only register it once rather than twice okay that's the dead time of counter simultaneous arrival of multiple particles maybe three or more particles uh, came to the detector at once but the register but the detector would only register it as one count as a result we would be getting uh, the value that is less than the true value right it will be underestimated simultaneous arrival of multiple particles only registers once fine and what else some particles may reach a detector but not cause ionization interesting I haven't seen this point before may reach the detector but not cause ionization okay so if you write these six points any two of these you could write any two of these and you would get two out of three marks so what do you need to write to get the final mark this is the most important 
point we gave explanations so now finally the measured so the measured count rate is actually less than the activity okay so the measured count rate is actually less than the activity due to all of these reasons fine finally we have reached the end of our paper chapter I mean question 10 a huge paper very taxing I'm only doing this for your exam tomorrow state Hubble's law identify any symbols that you use very very important Hubble's law states that speed is directly proportional to distance okay speed is directly proportional to distance and what else we use a constant actually this is the formula of that V is equal to H naught D the Hubble constant now we need to explain what these are so basically the speed V is the speed of recession right speed is actually this is how the road is speed of recession of a galaxy from an observer of a galaxy from an observer and what is D and distance D is the distance of the galaxy from the observer okay of the galaxy from the observer this is the gist speed is the speed of recession V from an observer and distance is the distance of the galaxy away from the observer now speed of recession means how fast it is moving away from the observer right now we have a star of luminosity and H naught is the Hubble constant A star of luminosity 3.8 into 10 power 31 watt is a distance of 1.8 into 10 power 4 meters away from the Earth. Now, calculate the radiant flux intensity at the Earth of the radiation emitted by the star. So we know that the formula for radiant flux intensity is F is equal to luminosity divided by 4 pi d square, where d is the distance. So this can be the star and the earth is over here so we know that the luminosity is actually uh, you know spread out in a three-dimensional space which is like a sphere so this is the distance or the radius of the sphere and since it's three-dimensional we have to take the total surface area of the sphere which is 4 pi r square and here the radius of the sphere happens to be the distance between them right so what do we get the radiant flux intensity equals to luminosity 3.8 into 10 power 31 divide by 4 pi times 1.8 into 10 to the power 24 whole square let's do that 3.8 into 10 to the power 31 divided by 4 pi into 1.8 into 10 to the power 24 whole square okay so f is actually 9.3 into 10 to the power minus 19 I'm opting for 2SF answer because my data is given to 2SF now the star in B is a distant galaxy, is in a distant galaxy. A spectral line in the light from the galaxy is known to have wavelength 486 nanometer. This spectral line in the light from the galaxy observed on the Earth has a wavelength of 492. So as you can see, the observed wavelength is greater than the actual wavelength, the laboratory value. Why is this? An increase in wavelength is basically the Doppler redshift. This is proof that the universe is expanding and the Big Bang took place and since then the universe has kept on expanding and has never stopped. Because you know that when an object moves away from you, the frequency decreases and the wavelength increases. Explain why the wavelength observed on the Earth is different from the wavelength that the galaxy is known to have emitted. The logic is the galaxy is moving away from the Earth. We are the observers on Earth is moving away from the Earth. And wavelength is increased by the Doppler effect or due to redshift, right? The wavelength of this light, of this light from galaxy, 
wavelength of light from the galaxy increased is increased by the Doppler effect by the Doppler effect yeah or you could just say due to the redshift due to redshift interesting now final answer finally determine a value for the Hubble constant H naught now we have to use the formula that I mentioned up top but before that I need to find out the speed of recession how using the formula for Doppler redshift which is given in the question paper it's over here this one Doppler redshift so we know that del lambda by lambda is equal to v by c where v is the speed of recession c is the speed of light so what is the change in wavelength it is basically 492 minus 486 which is simply just 6 so 492 minus 486 by always remember the original one original one 486 the truth not the observed one is equal to v by speed of light 3.00 into 10 to the power 8 so if you do solve this what do you get 492 minus 46 by 486 into 3 into 10 to the power 8 so we actually end up with v is equal to 3.7 into 10 power 1 to 3 4 5 6 into 10 power 6 meter per second now i just told you that uh, you know v is equal to h not d you know that v is equal to h not d so ultimately h naught equals to v by d which is h naught equals to 3.7 into 10 power 6 divided by the distance between them right 1.8 into 10 power 24 1.8 into 10 to the power 24 that gives us a value of h naught is equal to 2.1 into 10 to the power minus 18 2.1 into 10 to the power minus 18 per second okay that is it for us here we are done with the paper overall a uh, very difficult paper honestly speaking that is why so many of you have requested me to solve it personally I haven't struggled anywhere in any math I just felt like the table was quite complex for a lot of you guys I might have mis made a mistake here by drawing a straight line instead of a curved line uh, other than that everything seems all right everything seems all right but overall difficult paper and some marks might have been lost where you know this theory i might have lost one mark in this theory and then in the theory for you know the diffraction grading one right maybe one or two marks might have been lost but yeah th there's nothing to do in a huge paper like this where there's theory involved you might lose uh, one or two marks here and there okay and remember that the definition for gravitational field strength and electric field strength has changed it has turned into the definition for electric field strength and gravitational field strength instead and yeah these all these topics are high yield for your exam on the 9th of October so please look into this along with the other papers from 2023 and 2022 and 2021 i'll link those uh, at the end and you can also find it in a play uh, in the playlist also uh before finishing the video i just want to provide some clarification on the other variant that i've done recently uh, in the comments some of you did point out that a particular question could be done in a simpler way so let me just look into that okay so here we are so I wanted to provide clarification on um, the ideal gas question here you go this one over here yeah this cycle an easier way to complete the table actually right so for the change from A to B for the change from A to B clearly I told you that since volume is decreasing at constant pressure work is done on the gas so work done must be positive okay and now we can simply use PV is equal to NRT to find out the change in internal energy how check this 
we can use the formula PV is equal to nRT and we can make temperature the subject T is equal to PV by nR how is this relevant because the volume has decreased from A to B nR have remained constant P has also remained constant but V has decreased since V decreases uh, T will also decrease right and since this is an ideal gas clearly stated before uh, you guys know that I've mentioned in this particular video that typically internal energy is Ke plus Pe but since it has no IMF the internal energy is simply equal to Ke and Ke is equal to 3 by 2 Kt right that's the concept so we can say that U is also proportional to the temperature only so if volume decreases given that Pn and R are constant T will also decrease so if T decreases the internal energy must decrease that is why we can give a tick mark over here rather than the longer explanation I gave here although that was required for uh, writing the answer for part 2 but you could solve the table easily like this okay and what else what about this tick mark over here same concept applies check this uh, as you go from B to C yeah? as you go from B to C this change occurs at constant volume so let's go again for B to C you know that PV equals to nRT so T is equal to PV by nR similarly nR remains constant and over here the pressure does actually increase okay the pressure increases so it might indicate that um, given that a volume is constant it might indicate that T also increases right T also increases because in the last one when volume decreased from A to B given that everything else was constant T must also decrease and here we can apply the same constant uh, concept since NR remain constant as well as V as we are moving vertically upwards only pressure increases so if pressure increases then T must also increase and that is why internal energy must also increase since for an ideal gas uh, the internal energy is solely dependent on kinetic energy and kinetic energy is equal to 3 by 2 kT so that is the logic behind this that's how we can uh, fill up the table really easily and for this question over here we had to talk about uh, u is equal to q plus w okay that explanation was uh, overall fine that more work is done by the gas in cd okay then compared to ab or else it wouldn't match that is uh, mentioned in my uh, video over there but yeah I'll just uh, link this part uh, in the comment section and description box for my solve video for paper for one and thank you for pointing this out pointing this easy way out in the comments and if I did make any mistakes or solved any questions in a rather lengthy way please do comment below and yeah that's been it so if you've liked the video please do subscribe to the channel smash the like button it helps with the algorithm a lot uh, consider supporting me on patreon and yeah quick reminder to you guys a uh, quick shout out to my top tier patrons for the month uh, for this month we have Dewa Luna and Sean supporting me they're my top tier patrons so if you want to be featured on the end screen please do consider supporting me on patreon and we've recently launched our discord channel so you can also join us there and you can you know drop by and post your problems I'll solve them when I'm free and yeah please do download question papers from our site and I'll link the paper for May June 2023 variant 42 up here and the paper for February March 2023 variant 42 down here and the playlist for physics P4 up here and remember to subscribe to the channel see you guys bye bye